Because the film is such an extraordinary, extraordinary portrait of the psychology of experience. And it is not only one of the most meaningful pieces of cinema that I've ever seen on the close encounter thesis, and it stands in, 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 in high regard on those grounds alone, but it's also one of the most remarkable pieces of cinema that I've ever seen on the psychology of human experience. And so much was captured in terms of what happens when people don't listen to us, what happens when truth is violated, not only on a family level, but on a societal level as well. And one of the things I was so deeply struck by in the film, and I'm sure this touched everyone in this room, is that you could sense the earnestness, the searching quality, the ingenuousness of the experiencers and of those who were interacting with them versus the tone of the sterile, orthodox, almost, I, I say this in, a, in an a-spiritual way, almost high church tone of the so-called skeptics and the manner in which they were responding to this as if it was a priori nonsense and that we had to get down to diagnosing rather than recording what occurred. And you heard the editor uh, of the New England Journal of Medicine talking about how we here in the West live in an evidence-based uh, culture while he is simultaneously and in an unspoken way dismissing the evidence of testimony, dismissing the evidence of testimony, which is employed constantly uh, in the sciences, not only in the therapeutic sciences, but in the medical sciences as well. Any of you who have ever been hospitalized for pain know full well that y y the dosing of your meds and so forth is based upon your own testimony and explanation of the pain or the discomfort that you're experiencing. And this is what the entire field of psychopharmacology stands on and many other fields besides. This is a battle that's been going on in the Western sciences since the Victorian era. William James, another disparaged uh, Harvard psychologist, philosopher, and MD, was constantly arguing during the Victorian era that his colleagues much like John Mack's colleagues, recent to our own era, were rushing to dismiss any kind of testimony as just mere anecdote or something that was emergent internally from the witness. And James pointed out again and again that testimony over the arc of time becomes a record, and a record is evidence. And how, how can we possibly not acknowledge that as evidence, but you could you could see how certain of the media voices and the academic voices were very schooled at using this this terribly isolating sterile language to dismiss the experience of individuals, other than to almost condescend as to whether acknowledgement of the experience itself. Was, was, was helpful, as if acknowledgement of experience is up to a third party. And I'm heartened by something, though. I'm very, very deeply heartened by something uh, in this movie, and it, it touches upon uh, what, what Leslie was, was, was indicating in her remarks and the efforts that she and her colleagues uh, have been making uh, in the journalistic field, I think successfully, to bring this discussion more and more into the mainstream. And it's very interesting. Um, there's not a thoughtful person on earth today who is not alarmed by the coarsening of our political culture. Everybody who deserves to be called a sensitive or thoughtful human being cares about that. And there's something in this film, though, that, that, that very deeply touched me and that kind of turned on a, a light bulb. You know, Leslie made reference to the fact that we have to be patient. And I would ask you to linger over that for a moment. I would ask you to linger over that for a moment because those of us who really care about exploring questions of anomalies 
are in a tremendously advantageous uh, position as opposed to those people who are dedicated to politics. When you're dedicated to politics, a lot of the time you are absolutely forced to function within election cycles or within lawmaking cycles. You're trying to win um, a policy struggle. And by definition, there are fixed windows of time in which to do that. So politics, especially within election cycles or especially within cycles of, of um, congressional terms, legal dockets, and so on, become a blood sport. And if, if, if you don't participate in that blood sport, you're gonna lose. And there's a lot of people who would rather not participate in that blood sport, but force themselves to, because when your aims are very strict policy aims, you have narrow windows within which to function. Those of us who care about probing anomalies are not bound by those same windows. And it gives me tremendous hope, because it occurs to me that the term skepticism, like so many other terms that we use today, is very ill-fitting. Uh, I use terms like skeptic just because we have to speak in generalities to get our point across. But uh, to be skeptical is to be agnostic. And in a certain sense, as you could see from many of the individuals in this film, agnosticism is being reborn from within the culture that probes anomalies. We've lost a culture of skepticism uh, in the Western world to a very great extent. As soon as skepticism became a professional field uh, and as skeptics discovered that mendacity was an effective media strategy, a very unfortunate discovery, but as soon as they discovered that, a skepticism became something else. It became a kind of orthodox tribalism. Skepticism as a classical fact is actually being reborn from within the field of probing anomalies. And I don't need to tell anybody in this room, you could just see the way that John Mack was interacting with these children, the way that he was interacting with the adults, and the enormous compassion and intellectual integrity that was emanating from the man. Now, it's the privilege of the documentarian to show us what he or she wants us to see. But I think in this case, the documentarian acted with absolute integrity because in my experience, and I've hung around these neighborhoods for a long time, uh, I thought the examples that Randy and his colleagues chose were absolutely, absolutely representative. And uh, I, I don't know who among us in this room would feel differently. I mean, those were almost archetypal examples of the the questioners, the probers, the researchers, versus the, I'll say, the airsats skeptics. And the examples that Randy uh, showed us were extraordinary. I'll close on one last comment. Um, speaking of the phenomena um, depicted by the witnesses in the film, um, career skeptics are in love with uh, quoting the rationalist philosopher uh, David Hume who they aver made arguments against the existence of religious miracles. Um, they're not really representing what David Hume uh, wrote and said. Uh, Hume did not argue against uh, extraordinary events. Hume argued in favor of very high evidentiary uh, standards. And Hume offered a kind of formula which skeptics persistently miss, and the formula was uh, that if people report uh, an extraordinary event, that reportage should be greeted with a skepticism or agnosticism until, until you reach the point where the argumentation against the occurrence of the event becomes more fantastic than the event itself. And then the weight of evidence starts to shift on behalf of the witnesses. And I think that's what Randy demonstrated in this film. Thank you. Thank you.